we're still nailing down the details with both of those, so watch this space, um, but we're hoping to get them. But if not, we have a fantastic finale today and we're quite happy with that too. Um, we are good to go. Great, all right, welcome everybody. Um, I've been looking forward to this, uh, to today for a long time, um, not least because um, I go back a long way with the, uh, the main speaker, Kay Rayworth. Um, she was reminding me before we came on that uh, when we were together at Oxfam, she published her first scrappy paper on the donut and donut economics nine years ago tomorrow. So it's a kind of an anniversary, um, <laughs> bit of a stretch. Could everybody go uh, put their mics off, by the way, please? Thanks, should have said that at the beginning. Um, since then, uh, hold on. <clears throat> Uh, Deepa, can you put people on mute if they're not on mute? Thanks. Um, she was at Oxfam for many years and was one of the total stars within Oxfam. Uh, I pretended to manage her, she pretended to be managed by me, and it was a very harmonious relationship. Um, uh, and since then, she's, uh, she's moved on uh, and has become literally world famous, actually, uh, for, the, for her work on donut economics. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of her uh, spiel. Um, She's an economist focused on making economics fit for the 21st century, looking at not just the critique of economics, but what, how to fix it, which is fantastic. Her book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, is an international best bestseller that's been translated into 20 languages and was long listed for the 2017 Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. Um, and since then, since she published the book and it caused this huge you know, viral sensation, she has now set up something called the Donut Economics Action Lab to turn a book into practice in a really fascinating way. And that's what the focus of her talk will be today. She teaches at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute and is a professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. We also have a stellar discussant, uh, Michael Jacobs, who is a professorial fellow at the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute, Sperry, at Sheffield, Sheffield University, and is undertaking research on the idea of a post-neoliberal paradigm shift in economic theory, discourse, and policy, and is a lifelong environmentalist and will be perfectly placed to comment, I think, on, on what um, Kate sets out. His most recent book is Rethinking Capitalism, Economics, and Policy for Sustainable and Inclusive Growth, which was co-edited with Mariana Mazzucati. So it's not that this is some tiny coterie of people who give lectures and, ref, um, and plug each other's books. Honestly, that's just a, just a coincidence. All right. So Kate, you have about 40 minutes and then we'll go to uh, Michael. I should explain the format just for people who are joining on YouTube for the first time. We have a slightly odd format, which is we have Kate's presentation, Michael's response, and Kate's response to Michael is uh, on both Zoom and YouTube. And then at the end of Kate's response to Michael, I'm afraid we have to, to end the uh, online bit with YouTube and stay on Zoom for tedious security reasons. So if you're on YouTube and eagerly awaiting Q&A, sorry, you're gonna get cut off just before we get to Q&A. Um, but that's the way the current um, lecture series is designed. Kate, over to you, 40 minutes, looking forward to it. Thank you. And it's a very big pleasure to be here today. So I'm just gonna jump in and share my screen. Mm, I could share my screen. I don't seem to be allowed to be sharing my screen all of a sudden. Can I share my screen? Can't see it. No, it's not. It's just saying one participant can. Make sure I'm going to. I'm going to wait a moment. So it's great to be here. And as Duncan mentioned, um, yes, the donut paper was published nine years ago tomorrow when he and I were working together at Oxfam. So this feels like a very appropriate uh, moment to come back around. So here I go, I can share my screen, lovely. So yep, I'm gonna to talk today about putting donors economics into practice, turning it from a radical idea into practice. And I just wanna start with uh, the 20th century economics. So I'm gonna do it in one slide, 20th century economics, cause I think we still can. Uh, the reason I have uh, an issue with 20th century economics is because it's not moving nearly fast enough and it's still taught widely in universities around the world. So in three core images, iconic pictures. The first image of 20th century economics, which I believe is still the first image taught in many universities worldwide is of course supply and demand. Welcome to economics, here's the market. And we put the market right at the center of our vision as if that was what the economy was. 
and therefore we privilege price as the metric of concern and anything that falls outside the price in the market contract is of course called an, an externality and so we find ourselves in the bizarre situation here in the 21st century witnessing much of the death of the living world documented terrifyingly and tediously in statistics and economists still say yes yes that's called an environmental externality and that alone has to be an alarm bell that this theory and starting point is not fit for our times second the selfie of humanity who are we all too often we still show up in many of the major models that are used as rational economic man here he is a man for sure standing alone no dependence with money in his hand ego in his heart a calculator in his head and he's got nature at his feet he hates work, he loves luxury, he knows the price of everything. The real danger of him is that the more students learn of him, the more they admire and try to mimic his traits. Research has shown students say they value competition and self-interest over altruism and collaboration as they go from year one to year two to year three of economics. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And he is not helping us if we want to be 10 billion people thriving on this planet. And then the goal. The goal is never drawn in the textbooks. It doesn't need to be drawn because it's spoken in every speech by a politician and indeed underlies every macroeconomics class. The goal is endless economic growth. The idea that the, the progress shows up as a growing GDP, no matter how rich a nation already is. I'm sure that many people on this uh, webinar today are living in some of the world's highest income countries. These countries are richer than any nation before them has ever been in terms of income, and yet all these countries still believe that their future success depends upon yet more growth, and there's something absurd in that. I believe these ideas of 20th century economics, which economists might say, oh, that's far too crude, and it's much more nuanced than that, and yet they profoundly sit under our paradigms and our, our worldviews and our metaphors of what success looks like and they are destroying us because the 21st century has begun with multiple crises. We had the financial meltdown of 2008. We are living in an era of climate and ecological breakdown and most recently in COVID lockdown. And what these repeated recurring crises tell us, they may look different on the page, but actually they're telling us so many of the same things that we are deeply interdependent with each other and with the rest of the living world that there are sharp inequalities of how these crises hit, inequalities of gender and of race, of wealth and power, of global north and global south, and that these are crises emerge from the very systems that we've created. And I think they all emerge from a system that's based upon endless expansion. So if you have a financial system that presumes to endlessly expand, you'll probably kick off a subprime mortgage market. If you have an industrial system that endlessly aims to increase its use of fossil fuels and earth's resources, you will induce climate breakdown and ecological breakdown. And if we have human settlements that are endlessly expanding into wildlife areas, combined with ever growing travel between countries by plane, we create perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer and a global health pandemic. So we need to transform our vision of what human prosperity is away from the old metaphors and the theories of the 20th century that don't serve us. And therefore for this, I offer a donut as a new starting point. So imagine it as a compass for 21st century prosperity. Think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of that picture. And that means the hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life without the resources they need for food and healthcare, education and housing, political voice and income. Leave no one in the hole. You could say that was the 20th century agenda of human rights, ensure everyone has income and the workers have income to take home and they can buy and the state can pay for their needs. Yes, and yet that story comes apart. And there's an outer side to it because as we use Earth's resources, our collective impacts mean that we start to push ourselves beyond that outer ring, that ecological ceiling where we begin to break down the life supporting systems of planet Earth. And there we cause climate breakdown, there we acidify the oceans and create a hole in the ozone layer and break down the web of life. So on the inside, we've got the social dimensions of the sustainable development goals, which means that all the governments in the world have already agreed that all people in the world have a claim to these. That's pretty strong credentials. And on the outside, we've got the nine planetary boundaries of Earth system science, which were published only 11 years ago. So this is very new, this science of recognizing these Earth support systems. When we put them together in the simplest of terms, the aim of this is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. 
And suddenly the shape of progress has completely changed. We're not looking at a line of ever rising growth. We're looking at balance, which is a completely different feeling and one that's deeply familiar at the level of our own bodies and what health is. And yet we are far out of balance right now. All the red in this picture shows us the extent to which billions of people are falling short on their essential needs. For food, for example, that little red wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the picture because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. But you can see on all of those social dimensions, there are millions or billions of people falling short, most of them living in low-income countries, but there is of course deprivation in the midst of plenty, even in the richest countries and cities. And while we've got that enduring human deprivation, we've got massive overshoot of Earth's planetary boundaries, climate breakdown, excessive fertilizer use, land conversion, and breakdown of biodiversity in the web of life. So that's the double whammy and that's where we are. And this is humanity's 20th, 21st century self-portrait. This is who we are and how we are in these early days of the 21st century. And this is our generational challenge. And once we've seen this picture, we can't unsee it. And once we've seen it and taken on its challenge, it's immediately obvious that last century's economic theories and economic policies and business models are, are no use to us because they weren't designed to solve for this. We need new theories and new policies and new business models that are designed for our times. I sincerely believe our children's children will turn back to these days and ask us, what did we do once we knew? How did we transform what we taught and what we learned and what we practiced and what policies we put in place and what we voted for and what, how we lived our own lives once we knew? I'm showing you a picture of the global scale. So this is all of humanity and the whole planet. But of course, most policy making and decision making happens at a much lower scale. So some researchers at Leeds University, Andrew Fanning, Julia Steinberger, Will Lamb, Dan O'Neill, did some brilliant work downscaling the donut to the national level. And here are just three nations. So at one end, we have Malawi. You can see there's a lot of red shortfalls. So people are falling short on the vast majority of their basic needs in Malawi. And yet they're not overshooting their pressure on any of those planetary boundaries. And that's a country that's generating around $1,000 per person per year. In the middle, we've got China, like many countries, both significantly falling short on meeting people's essential needs and already significantly overshooting those planetary boundaries on around $17,000 per person per year. And then we've got Norway. And I've chosen Norway because, well, Norway is always at the top of the human development index, isn't it? Aren't the Scandinavians great, perfect places to live? It's one of the few countries in the world that's got a totally blue circle in the middle. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everything is fine for everybody in Norway. This social foundation is a very low, globally, internationally comparable uh, standard. So all high income countries should just be smashing that. All high income countries should have a blue circle. They've all got the resources to ensure that everybody could lead a decent life, but only a few of them actually do it. And Norway's one, and that's why it's at the top of the Human Development Index. Good on health, good on education, really high income, but look at that overshoot, massive ecological overshoot. And to be clear, this isn't just resource use and emissions in the land that we call Norway. It's all the resources and emissions embedded in the imports into the country. So it's consumption-based emissions, consumption-based footprint. And by the way, I'm picking on Norway, but all high income countries look pretty much like this. So let me put these countries now in a, a context of over 100 countries and the sweet spot, the place you want to be is the top left hand corner where we're meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. And you can immediately see there's no country anywhere near. And to me, this just tells us there's no such thing as a developed nation. If we take this as our uh, standard for human prosperity and well-being, there's no country in the world that can say we're developed, we're advanced. I, I challenge anybody to take me there because I can't see one. Here's the three countries I picked out, Malawi, China, Norway, at very different places in this spectrum, but just let's think of it from each group of countries perspective. So the lower income countries are on an unprecedented journey to meet the needs of all people for the first time without overshooting planetary boundaries in the way that every nation before them has done. So how are they gonna do that? How are they gonna leapfrog that, reinvent that? And what finance and assistance and technology and transformation of global trade rules are owed to them to make that possible? Middle income countries have the double whammy of meeting their people's needs for the first time, already significantly coming back within planetary boundaries. How are they going to do that? And many of those countries are at really pivotal moments of putting in massive infrastructure, be it housing, of transport, of energy, of communications. How do they make sure those infrastructural choices pivot them to the future we want rather than lock them into the old one? 
And then there's the high income countries that are closer than any other to meeting people's needs, but still ain't doing it and have the unprecedented journey of moving way back into those planetary boundaries because they are in massive overshoot. And that's never been done before either. So all countries here are facing an unprecedented transformational journey. And I think it means for all a healthy dose of humility and unprecedented ambition. And then lastly, on this picture, just to point out the obvious, these countries stand on this page as if they're all separate little dots all in their own journey. But of course, they, their, their stories are deeply intertwined through history, the histories of colonialism, through ongoing relations of military power, structural adjustment rules imposed by the World Bank in the 1980s, finance and trade rules that are still imposed through international institutions, ongoing resource extraction and land grabs, and then current and future climate change impacts. Predominantly, all of these are powers from the global north impacting upon the global south. And so we need to see transformations within every nation, but also between the relations of nations. So that's at the national level. I'm gonna come down another level because the way we actually began putting the donut into practice is at the level of the city. And so I want to go from the global through the national down to the level of the city. And the city I'm gonna choose here is Amsterdam because it was the first city to say, actually, we're going to do a donut analysis of our city and publish it. Um, so let's just bring our minds to the city of Amsterdam. But you can imagine this for any city that you know of. Um, I'm focusing around global North cities now because that's where we began and that's where we think the responsibility to transform is, is highest and, and must happen fastest but we can use this framework in an adapted way, we believe anywhere in the world. So we asked this question, bringing this donut concern, how can Amsterdam become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? As you can hear, there's a lot in there. So I'm gonna break it out into what we've called the four lenses of the portrait that we create for any city. There's a social lens and an ecological lens, there's the local and the global. So we start with the local social lens. What would it mean for the people of Amsterdam to thrive? And of course, it's the people of Amsterdam who need to define that based on their diversity, their values, their culture, their history. What is a good life? And, and how far away are they from that? And what's the, what's the diversity of experience there? And where are the inequalities in that city and how can they be overcome? But add to that, what would it mean for Amsterdam to thrive within its natural habitat? I mean, where on planet Earth is Amsterdam? By the way, it's below sea level and it's artificially reclaimed from the sea on that land. So it's a really unusual city in that sense. But what is nature's genius there? How does nature perform there? And what would it mean if the city actually belonged with nature and was resilient to climate change impacts in the way that nature there is? How can the city learn from the natural habitat around it of how nature houses biodiversity and stores groundwater and sequesters carbon and cools the air. How can that learning be brought into the city? And these are the ideas of the brilliant biomimicry thinker, Janine Benyus, who really worked with us to create this, this framework. How do we learn from how nature thrives and succeeds in a place to bring that into the design of that city? So those two, thriving people in a thriving place, that sets out local aspiration and you can go to a city and say wow you know people lead a good life here and you've got all their their needs and it's clean air and clean water isn't this a lovely place to live but that local aspiration of course is only half the story because every city especially those of the global north have to recognize their global responsibility because we're set in embedded relationships with the rest of the living world and with the rest of humanity so we have to ask what would it mean for amsterdam to respect the health of the whole planet now the Netherlands, like Norway, is massively overshooting its share of pressure on planetary boundaries. So, so is Amsterdam. And we downscaled Amsterdam's planetary boundaries. There's a lot of red in the picture. It's not pretty. How is Amsterdam gonna transform the way it lives so that its, its carbon emissions come back within its share of pressure on the planet? It's, it's use of Earth's resources and fertilizer and materials and minerals and water come back. That's never been done before. What would it look like to bring Amsterdam back within planetary boundaries, thinking through its relationship, they say, through global supply chains of food and imported clothing and construction materials and electronics and consumer goods. How can it do that? As a city, what levers does it have to make that difference? And then lastly, think again of those supply chains 
and the people in them. How can, what would it mean for Amsterdam to respect the well-being of people worldwide? The people who picked and packed the food, who stitched and sewed the clothes, who assembled the phones, who dug and shipped the minerals. What are the labor rights for those people, the working conditions? What are the impacts on communities who live aware the lithium mines that are being mined to create electric batteries for the new electric cars coming into cities? How are people worldwide affected how, by how cities are choosing to live? And what rights do they have to ensure that cities live in ways that respect that? So these are the four lenses of our city portrait. And as you can imagine, it's a deep dive going into each one. We've actually created them in three cities, Philadelphia, Portland, and Amsterdam. And these photographs, of course, are pre-COVID. These were taken at the end of 2019 when we held workshops in each of the cities, inviting policymakers to sit around their city portrait, get familiar with the targets that they had already set as policymakers and the data we put against them. So this is the ambition you have of what it means to thrive or your carbon emissions. And this is how you're performing and how are you going to get, how are you going to match your performance to where you want to be? And how you can look at the synergy and the interconnection and some of the tensions between these different lenses. What we got from these policymakers and community members who are there with them was the desire to come out of their silos. And they said, you know, I just I work on sewage or transport or education or housing. And I know I need to connect with my colleagues and we need to change the way we work as a city so that we can have these synergistic conversations across and look for new solutions that actually tackle multiple challenges at the same time. So. What kind of conversations will we actually be having if we were starting to think about cities with this portrait in mind? And now I want to just come back to the starting point of economics, because for me, all economics should begin with this diagram or something that does the same job as it. Let's start not with the market and supply and demand, like diving right in as if that was what we first needed to put in the center of our vision. Let's start with the big picture. Let's start by recognizing that the economy is a subset of society, is a social construct based upon social relationships. And the society is embedded in the living world. And, and the economy is drawing in Earth's materials and matter and spewing out waste and pollution and is bathed in a river of solar energy. So there's the second law of thermodynamics from day one. So we can ask the essential question of ecological economics right from the beginning. How big can the economy's through flow of materials be before it begins to disrupt the life support systems of the planet? That's not an environmental externality. It's a very, very real 21st century reality. But then let's look inside the economy itself. Yes, there's the market. And because we always start economics with the market, then who we show up as as people is that little character rational economic man, as if who we are in the economy is somebody either consumer or producer. We're either shopping or working or shopping or working or shopping or working. And now let's go into working. Let's ask in terms of power relationships, are you labor receiving only a wage or are you capital owner receiving the rentier economy returns? Because that's gonna make a huge difference. So we can start in the market, but of course we have to recognize that there's the crucial role of the state and we have multiple relations to the state as well. We may be public servant, and public servants have been getting far more recognition than usual in recent months and years. We may be resident of a city or a nation, a voter and a protester, all of which are really valuable roles that each one of us can play in relation to the state. This is the 20th century boxing match, right? The ideological boxing match, or are you free market, let's say, capitalist, or are you state loving socialist? And the 20th century got so obsessed with this boxing match, and this is all that shows up in GDP, that it completely ignored two other fundamental forms of provisioning for our daily wants and needs that are of course essential to life. The first being the household where we all begin every day. Unless we're a student and ironically we're plucked from the household, living in rented accommodation, sometimes eating in halls. So you're out of the household relationship just at the moment when you're learning about these, these relations, which is an irony that it makes it much harder, I think, for students to witness it and be part of it. So in the household, we are parent or partner, relative and child, or maybe all of them at the same time. That's the unpaid caring work, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, that goes into making labor ready for work every day and getting labor well again when labor has been ill and raising the next generation of children to be fit for being part of society and being fit for work. And of course, this is the traditional area of unpaid work of women. And then there's the commons, the place where people to come together, not through the market or the state, but as a community, co-creating goods and services that they value often without money changing hands. So this is the space of a volunteer, a sharer, a co-creator, a steward. 
And we all move through all of these relations. If we were any one of us were to chart our own day, we might realize that we move almost seamlessly through these without naming them, but we are constantly juggling our roles in them. So we have to start recognizing that we have multiple economic identities and they're often in tension for our time and attention and care, but they're all essential to provisioning for our wants and needs. And what COVID's done, if it's done one thing, is showing us that when the market space is physically closed due to the need for physical distancing, that the role of the state suddenly comes up, stepping in with services, but also underpinning those wage, those wage relationships that in the market that got shut down. Household work goes up, the pressure of caring for the ill, of homeschooling children. Many people have found joy in the household. Many people have found extreme stress and domestic violence. So very, very uneven experience of what it's like to be literally locked in that household relationship. And the commons. People realizing the importance of the commons, whether it's through creating a food bank or merely creating a WhatsApp group for your street so that everybody can connect and feel like they're part of a community. And as researchers across different countries have found, many people say, one thing I don't want to lose after lockdown is that sense of we, the we of society. How do we hold that and make that as part of the society we want to be as we go forward? So there's the recognizing our multiple roles. And of course, when we bring this to the scale of a city, there's a lot that cities can do and, and recognize that the, the richness of enabling all of their residents to play these multiple roles. How do you design a city to enable people to be in all of these spaces and to have that rich life? But also we need to transform the dynamics of our economies and of our cities. So I believe there are two fundamental dynamics that need to be transformed. The first is that we've inherited degenerative industrial structures that are running down Earth's life support systems industries that essentially take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that's what's pushing us over planetary boundaries. And we need to create regenerative systems that uh, use Earth's materials again and again, far more carefully and collectively and creatively and slowly so that we work with and within the cycles of the living world. What could this look like in a city? So first of all, Europe is beginning to get with it. We've got new legislation coming, I still say we, they, Europe now have new legislation coming in, the right to repair, which means that people will have the right to have their uh, equipment from washing machines to mobile phones repaired, which begins to end some of that inbuilt obsolescence into products and enables them to be part of a circular economy. Amsterdam have introduced ambition to be a full circular economy by 2050. That means they say by 2030, half of the materials that are being used in the city, only half of them can be new materials, half of them must already be circular. And so they've put that into legislation in the construction sector. And so you've got the beginnings of circular building in Amsterdam. Transport, cities like Paris and many others have used COVID and the shutdown of the streets to literally repaint the lines on the street and turn over major streets like Rue de Rivoli to the cyclists. The majority of people say they want it to stay this way. I think around 40% of people who are cycling are new to cycling, more women are cycling. This is transforming who gets around and how they get around. And then in the city of Medellin in Colombia, the river used to be treated as a really convenient industrial sewer, just take that toxic waste away. And then they recognized actually, where are we on planet earth? And the river is part of the living place. Let's recognize the river as life. Let's open up the area around the river and create river parks. So bringing life back to the heart of the city and recognizing where on it, as part of the biome and ecology that the city's placed. So that's some ideas and examples on regenerative design taking off in cities. We also need to transform another dynamic. We've inherited economies at the city level, but certainly at the national and international level that are divisive by design, that drive opportunity and value into few hands. Internationally, over the last decade, the number of billionaires globally has doubled from 1 billion globally, 1 million, 1,000 billionaires to 2,000 billionaires worldwide. So opportunity and value being concentrated in the very, very richest of hands, but we see these patterns replicated throughout societies. And we need to create societies that are distributive by design so that opportunity and value are shared far more equitably with all in society who co-create it. What can cities do towards this? They can't do everything, but they can do a lot. I'm gonna go first to the city of Preston, which is probably the UK's greatest export at the moment. Everybody wants to talk about Preston, what they're doing. Councillor Matthew Brown there has led using procurement in Preston to say, hey, we've got big budgets here. And though the big, big businesses don't want to build their super shopping malls here, we can use the way we procure 
through the city administration, through the hospitals and the schools and the museums, we can use our budgets to buy locally and to buy from small scale businesses and to rebuild that fabric and the web of small and medium enterprise here. And we can even rebuild the marketplace. So they rebuilt the marketplace, of course, using a local contracting company. And, and so they're be beginning to rebuild that fabric and web of uh, density of small and medium enterprise in the community. That is distributive ownership of business. In uh, Argentina and Chile, the brilliant architect Alejandro Aravena realized that many people would just never be able to afford to buy a house. It's just too expensive. But he figured that a lot of people could actually afford half a house. They could put down a down payment for that. So he's designed and started building half houses that have all you need with the heating and electricity and the plumbing. You buy that. And then when you've saved up enough money, you can build the rest and fill it in. And through this mere change in the architectural plan of what a house is, he has opened up house ownership to a whole swathe of people who otherwise would have spent their whole lives in the rental market. In Bogota, recognizing that there can be public luxury in small pockets of space. So turning a car park into a play park and making it a place where people can meet and they can meet people like themselves there and people who are not like themselves there. And that is how you begin to build the fabric of community and society. And that is the uh, open commons. And then living wages. So Seattle in the US was one of the first cities to introduce a living wage, $15 an hour. When they were introducing it, people said, well, nobody will be able to afford to go to restaurants here anymore. It turned out that actually even the wait staff could now afford to go to restaurants. But living wages, it's not enough to do it only in your city and high income countries. What would it take to say we need to recognize living wages throughout global supply chains? How can we start doing that? Some multinational companies like Unilever have just recently committed to doing that by 2030. What would it mean for cities to commit to doing that in their procurement? So regenerative and distributive by design, but what makes a city able to pivot there or not? I'm fascinated talking to, to, to city councillors and mayors and listening to the different way they talk about their cities. And some are stuck serving growth, still asking that 20th century question, how do we make our city grow? What is our city GDP? Are we bringing in the big business? Is it going up? And others are in a completely different space saying, how do we make our city thrive? And I think there are five key design traits of the institutions that shape this. So what really matters about cities, I think, is not just the layout of the streets and the infrastructure and the cycle lanes. It's the design of their own institutions. And I'm just going to talk briefly with examples of all of these five. So purpose. What's the purpose of the city? What's it in service of? What's its ambition? Amsterdam is a city that's impressed me. They said, well, we have a, a, a circular strategy. We've got plans on sustainability. We've got a, a low energy transition strategy. We want to make our city more equitable and, and we want to make sure that people are involved in the way that they do this. And so when they came across the donut, they said, you know what, that just brings together everything for us under one umbrella. And so they adopted the donut as their concept. They made it Amsterdam orange, drew their own version and, and, pu and published their um, donut report in April last year. And then they've got this claim. They say, uh, we want, our vision is for Amsterdam to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. Now, to me, I hear transformation there because it's the word while respecting planetary boundaries or within planetary boundaries or within the means of the planet. When you start to hear that bounded sense, we want thriving within, then you know we're in a different paradigm. But of course, it's, it's not enough just to write a really great new statement on your city website and to put in the mayor's speeches, you've got to then turn it into practice through these other design traits. So networks, how does the city use its power of procurement and its networks? I was talking earlier about anchor institutions in Preston and Preston really has pioneered this as, as well as Cleveland and Ohio. Circular procurement in Amsterdam, I said they're gonna be 100% circular by 2050, halfway there by 2030. And they're saying, well, by 2022, 10% of all the materials in government procured contracts in the city of Amsterdam have to be circular products. So they're writing it in right now. And to me, that's a really good set of long-term vision. And we don't know how, we don't know what that looks like by 2050, but a decade away, that's a lot of transformation. And next year already, that is legislation that starts to make things change. In Cleveland, Ohio, the university hospital is placed right in a neighborhood, a low income neighborhood. And they realized that many of their staff who are applying for their jobs were coming from far away. So they set up a special scheme to say, can we enable people who live in this neighborhood who might be from low income and low, lower educated backgrounds, mothers returning for work, people who have a conviction 
who deserve a second chance? Can we create an employment scheme that gets them into our hospitals? And that's been a really successful way of connecting to the local economy. That's distributive employment. And then in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne brought together a, a range of major local partners and said, let's together commit to buying wind power for 10 years at a fixed price. And that commitment and that scale of contract meant that a new wind turbine farm could be built and therefore bring forward renewable energy as the energy of the city far faster than it otherwise would have happened. Governance. So many things through governance from citizens assemblies and bringing in the voices of people who don't have to try and get reelected in four years time to ambitious regulation like I've mentioned in Amsterdam. I'll add there that by 2030 there will be no fossil fuel cars in Amsterdam. By 2025 there'll be no fossil fuel boats in the city's canals. That's a really clear long loud and legal message to business and to transport. If you're not going to get with it you're going to have to get out. So it allows and it it forces but permits industry to just start changing now and then to learn through experiments and new metrics there's a district in Amsterdam called Bike Schlotterham which was going to be developed then it didn't happen they said right let's make this an experimental district circular building let's learn from what happens here and let's create new metrics so that we know how and when we're becoming a circular economy now let's get down to the serious stuff down to ownership who owns the sources of wealth creation in your city who owns the land and housing in Vienna, the majority of people, over 60% of people, live in city-owned housing, social housing that's owned either by the city or by um, cooperatives that are run by the city. And that means that social housing is high quality, highly affordable, and it creates a very equitable um, affordability of housing for people, so different from the vast majority of high-income cities in the world. What about if utilities like in Omaha are owned by the community, not by a multinational utility company? Returns power and the return of the revenue to the city. Data, Barcelona is one of the first cities to say, we recognize data as a very valuable 21st century asset and we're committed to open data relationships with our residents. And then business, who owns the businesses in your city? Are they major multinationals that might just shut down and leave the high street? Or are they local enterprises like are being re-encouraged in, in Cleveland, Ohio and in Preston? All of these have huge implications for who gains the returns from wealth creation and whether it's distributive or divisive. And so let's go down to the last one and finance. Is finance in service of the city or is actually your city in service to finance? And we can all think of quite a few cities in the world that are definitely in service to finance. So where does the city revenue come from? In Portland, I was amazed to find that really a lot of the city's revenue comes from car parking charges. So if they're going to move cars out of the city centre, they have to find a new source of revenue. What's the city doing recognising that the major multinational banks haven't been that very interested in serving small and medium enterprises? Many cities are setting up credit unions, credit banks like Van City and Vancouver. And then what can the city do with its own funds, its own pension money? How does it make sure it divests from fossil fuels and invests that money in the future that it already wants to bring about? So those are five design traits that I would say lie at the heart of every city's design that really determine whether it's still focused on serving growth or can pivot to serving thriving. We did this report with Amsterdam and launched it in April 2020. We did Amsterdam City Donut. Uh, the Guardian published an article about it, it just went viral. It was really interesting. It was actually the height of the COVID response in Amsterdam. They had the highest rate of infection and they released their portrait that month. And as the deputy mayor said, well, you know, sometimes in the darkness, that's when you most need to see or most can see the light. And we need a vision of where we want to go when we emerge from this emergency. At the same time, there was the formation of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. As you can see, these people standing, waving around, very silly donut. That's them. The Dutch really go for it. We, as Donut Economics Action Lab, launched the City Portrait methodology in July that year. So we said, well, this is how we did it. We did this with Amsterdam. This is the methodology we followed. And you don't have to do it exactly, but basically this is how we did it. And then by November, there were initiatives in all of these cities, not all led by the city government, to be very clear. The ones that are led by the city government are in Brussels, in Copenhagen, in Nanaimo, in Canada. Um, and it's picking up, kicking off in lots of different places. But there's change makers making that happen. Now, I've just started talking about the power of peer to peer inspiration. And so I'm just going to pivot away from saying this is how we're putting donut economics into action to really to go now to a reflective a final part of this talk, which I really want to talk about how are we doing this, because we have never asked anybody. I mean, I've never once asked anybody to talk about the donut, use the donut, promote it, put it into practice, never convinced or pressurized anybody. This is all through people saying we choose it and it's all through pull. So I just want to pull back. As we said at the beginning, uh, nine years ago tomorrow is the day 
that the donut discussion paper was published by Oxfam as just a discussion paper. And it was a, it, the idea got a lot of traction quite quickly. And I decided a year later to leave Oxfam to do what I felt was the most useful piece of advocacy I could do next, which was to turn this discussion paper into a book. And so I wrote Donut Economics, the book, which came out in 2017. Then I spent about two years giving presentations, which was great because there was just a lot of interest and a lot of demand going round and round talking. Couldn't, wouldn't it be interesting if you did this, you could do that, and talk, talk, talk. And then I just thought, okay, enough talk. Who actually wants to do this? Who comes up to me at the end of a talk and says, yeah, but I really actually want to do this. I am doing this. I'm going to do this. I'm putting this into practice. And that was the moment when I realized if, if this is going to go beyond just a talk of an idea that could be, we need to create an organization. And as Duncan could be the first to tell you, I was a very, very happy researcher sitting in the research team in Oxfam, just beavering away, doing my analyses. I never had any plans to set up an organization. So it was quite an uncomfortable push in myself to realize, actually, I need to step up and make this happen if this idea is going to be given the space that it seems to want to take off in the world. So the first thing was to call some people who had clustered around and said, I'm into this. We gathered in my kitchen with a big whiteboard and drew up an idea for Donut Economics Action Lab. Um, some months later, we hired a little office that, of course, we've spent almost no time in since then. A little office in the make space in Oxford began to imagine we would put together a team that would work there. We're now distributed all over the place. We've grown from three people to seven during lockdown and most of our team have never met each other. And then we created a community design team of people all over the world who'd expressed interest in donut economics saying, we're gonna create a platform. So we want to create it with people who we believe are going to be part of that community. Come and help us design it. And we got amazing support and input from them about what would be useful in the design of that platform. And we launched it in September last year. So people, anyone can join around the world and upload um, ideas and create events and create tools and share stories of what they're doing and how they are themselves putting donut economics into practice. And what's lovely about this is that the idea is just coming back at us now of what people are doing and how they're adapting it in ways that we, of course, would never have imagined. So that's the foundations. And now I'm just gonna just finish this with some reflections on how we're, how we're developing this and the ideas and the strategies we're taking to make this happen. So the inspiration for our approach come from several books and organizations from the book New Power, which for me was a really valuable book about uh, how do you take an idea and make sure it's actionable, it's connecting and it's extensible. So pe people pick it up and change it and make it their own and bring it back to you. That was a, that's been a phenomenally valuable book. And then Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows, the classic systems thinking book, which helps you really think about if you're intervening in a system trying to uh, trying to change it or even transform it, where are you intervening? What level do you think you're intervening on? And what's the most effective place to be intervening? So you can really help to conceptualize how you're engaging in the system. I'm a big fan of the Three Horizons framework, which invites you to ask, if we're putting a disruptive idea out there in the world, how do we make sure it gets harnessed to bring about the new economy we want to create, rather than captured and co-opted by the old economy we're trying to bring down? If that sounds of interest to you, I made a, I'm an evangelist for this. So I made a six minute little video that's on YouTube of just introducing the Three Horizons framework. But by, this book by Graham Lester on transformative innovation talks about it in detail and was just a complete revelation for me. And I wish we'd always planned every Oxfam campaign I'd worked on using that tool once I knew it. And then we we're also inspired by WikiHouse, which combines ownership of um, trademark of a concept with putting the ideas in the Creative Commons. We've taken advice from them and done that with learning from Impact Hub in Birmingham, amazing change makers, building community, building an organization. So as a little team, how do you build and create a culture that you want to be part of? And then from Extinction Rebellion, how do you create simple principles that people can choose to pick up and put into practice with all the tension that that brings of that openness of how people use it and put into practice? We use uh, the multi-level perspective. Some people call it GEALS, Others would call it Hiles. It depends <laughs> which part of Europe you want to say his name from. But we use this perspective. It looks like a very detailed diagram. I'm not going to talk the whole thing through. But the idea is that there's always a, a landscape, the kind of exogenous context or the narrative and the worldview in which we live. Then there's the socio-technical regime. There's the institutions and the frameworks and the policies that you need to actually change regulations and rules and norms and practices and technology. And then at the bottom, there's those really exciting little arrows that the niche innovators, they're the people who pop up doing crazy, innovative things, disrupting, and they disrupt that system 
and something breaks apart and then they enable the formation of a new system if it goes well. So we think of ourselves working from a world of ecological crisis towards thriving in balance. And as Donut Economics Action Lab, we work at all three of these levels. So we work at the level of reframing economic narratives. We work at the level of engaging in strategic policy influence where we're invited. Of course, all of this is only wherever we're invited. If people think we can be useful in an ongoing policy debate, we step in and we work a lot with collaborative innovators who are showing up in our community and our platform and doing crazy things with the donut and using it to create disruptive movements and events in their communities, whether it's in a community or in business or in teaching or in a city or at the national level. We follow these principles. And I'm really happy to come back to any of them later in the questions. We, we go where the energy is. We don't waste time knocking on shut doors. As a mom of very small twins, when I was doing this work, that was just a necessity, but it's turned out to be a great rule to follow. We know that there's huge power in peer-to-peer -peer inspiration, as I showed with cities. So we aim to amplify what others are doing because peers inspire peers. We have to balance openness with integrity, and I'm going to come back to that. We aim to be agile and adaptive so we don't lock ourselves down in log frames and promise to do X number of projects and X number of outcomes because who knows what might happen in the world. We want to be a small team with big impact and that means we need to design ourselves to stay small and not think that we always need to expand. How do we work really, really well with others to make that happen? And then we don't want to be the movement, we want to join the movement because there's an amazing new economics movement out there. So how do we collaborate with other organizations? So. We want to be part of the movement and here are some of the organizations that we already work with and we want to work with many many more we are thrilled that influential people and organizations have been choosing to talk about and use and work with donut economics from the pope to david attenborough from the women's equality party to the world economic forum to extinction rebellion it's great for us to hear how they choose to engage with it and how they pick it up so that's at shaping the level of the narrative Communities and local groups have been picking it up and, and putting it into action in ways we never expected. So I mentioned the Amsterdam Donut Coalition who just spontaneously formed. There were lots of people in Amsterdam who said, well, we're all using this framework. Why don't we get together and, and, and start putting it in practice together? We're stronger when we work together as a network. And their creation and posting a story about it in our platform has just sparked off so many others because anybody can go on our platform and say, well, I, I, hi, I'm in London. And does anybody want to join? Anyone, any other members here? I'm going to post an event. Let's join on Zoom in a month's time and see who shows up and see what we start doing. And there's some amazing work that these folks have started doing. Then the people leading each of these groups, now they've made their own group and they're um, working together. We, we're just observing and, and finding out that this is what they're doing. So they are spreading this work and teaching each other how they are putting it into practice. Education and research, it's always been a thrill to me to see teachers post things like this saying, you know what, it's the first day of the, of the new year and this is the first diagram I want to show to my students. It's not on the curriculum, but I want them to engage with the bigger picture and their role in the world as geographers. And teachers and students have been picking it up and using it in secondary education a lot. And a real coup for us, um, a thrill was to find out that the International Baccalaureate textbook published by um, OUP, Oxford University Press, now includes the donut as a core concept, which means that all teachers teaching the baccalaurea can now include it as part of the syllabus. So it's come into the syllabus through that textbook. And on our website, on our platform, we've got a list of over 50 academic articles that are using the donut as part of the analysis. If anybody is interested in thinking about it in terms of uh, master's dissertation or research, we're documenting all that emerging work. Now, here's the big one, business, the donut and business. Ever since the donut was first published in 2012, companies have come and said, oh, yes, we, that sounds interesting. We like to use that. And this is our place where we most fear being greenwashed. And you can absolutely imagine because there's a real danger that companies intentionally or unintentionally pick up the donut and turn it into a really handy tool for business. In fact, one company, and I won't name them, they showed me with great pride their, their donut that they'd made and they'd taken out the social foundation, they replaced it with a business foundation and business needs and interests and income and profit and marketing and branding. And I just said, do you see what you did there? And they, oh no, wow, they, had, they just hadn't seen that. So there is a real risk that we have put the donut out there in the creative commons and, and yet the real risk to us and the biggest risk we identify for our, our way of working is that business takes it and uses it and greenwashes it and downgrades it and it loses its credibility and then nobody wants to use it. And that's too big a risk for us to take. We've decided that when business as usual meets a transformative idea, 
something is going to get transformed and it's our job to make sure it's not us. So when it comes to business, we have a tool for business and we've said, here is the place where we, we, we're going to lean away from openness. We're going to lean to protecting integrity. So right now, our policy is that, yes, businesses can use the donut, but only as a tool for internal reflection. There's loads of work to do, guys, by the way, inside your companies. So there's the video. There's the, there's the methods for using. Go and reflect in your business. You cannot use it for public facing communications. A, a very well-known UK high street bank asked me a couple of years ago to pay £5,000 for me to make a little video they could put on their website. And we said, no, thanks, but no thanks. Go and do the work inside your company. We don't see anything transformative happening in this bank. Why would we want to be on your website? Go and do the work. Don't just use us for PR. And not for pro only uh, for-profit organizations cannot lead publicly facing initiatives and events using the donut. Now, of course, there are some really fantastic purpose-driven public uh, for-profit organizations, and these rules are preventing them from doing that. Yes, and that is uh, something we just had to say. For now, we need to protect this. We can't, at this moment, differentiate between them all, and therefore we're going to protect the donor. We're planning on recruiting more people to our team and somebody to lead in this area, and we're going to open this up in a way that we can control and that we make sure that business doesn't transform us, but that if business wants to engage with the donut, business goes through transformation. So I'm just going to end. We're very far away now from starting with supply and demand and rational economic man and endless growth. We're in a space where the goal of progress is thriving and balance. We need to be distributive and regenerative by design, recognize the big we of society and our multiple economic roles, that the economy is embedded in society and the living world, and that it's the design of institutions their purpose, their networks, their governance, and their ownership and how they're financed that basically determines whether or not we can do this. If it sounds fun and interesting, we really welcome you to join us at Donut Economics Action Lab. Use the tools, add your own stories, help us put this into practice. I profoundly believe that 21st century economics is going to be practiced first and theorized later, and this is our contribution to making it happen. So I'll stop there and really enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Fantastic, Kate. Absolutely brilliant. Um, going to go to uh, Michael in a second, so come on camera. While Michael's speaking, um, have a think about your questions, because if you get in first, you've got a better chance of getting an answer. Um, so put your questions in the chat and we will uh, monitor that and go to Q&A. But first we'll have Michael and then if Kate feels so moved, Kate can respond to, to Michael. Okay, over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, and if any of you are wondering why Kate had been invited to do this uh, and you hadn't realised already, I'm sure you now understand. Kate has been going around the world inspiring people over the last three years um, in the way that uh, I imagine she's just inspired you. And uh, I come at this as an environmental economist, a political economist. I first started writing about uh, environmental economics. Um, in, in the 1980s, I published uh, a book in 1991 called The Green Economy, um, which uh, was a miserable failure um, as a book uh, in comparison with Kate's book, which has stormed the world. And uh, I have to say that I think uh, what Kate has done is, is incredibly important. Um, and why I think it's important is because it's a framework of thinking that Kate has managed to uh, create, which is both profound and simple. And that's a very remarkable thing to have done. It's profound because it captures, uh, and not just captures in words, but captures in a picture. And of course, a picture is worth a thousand words, as we know, in fact, many more than a thousand. It's captured in a picture, along with the accompanying words and the accompanying videos. And Kate's been brilliant at, uh, at making videos uh, as well as writing. Um, both the reality of our incredibly troubled, crisis-ridden world, in which we have simultaneously huge poverty, particularly obviously in the developing world, as it should no longer be called, but in the low-income countries, and but also in rich countries, and what I think we should learn to call ill-being, the opposite of well-being, both in both kinds of countries, but certainly not only uh, in low income countries. And the environmental crisis, which is a crisis, as she says, picking up on the planetary boundaries 
um, work uh, of the Stockholm Resilience Centre um, uh, of overshoot of the environmental limits which our planet um, uh, provides. And she's managed to capture the reality of those crises, the multiple social and environmental crises, and also about how we can think about what to do about them. And she's done so in a way that is incredibly sophisticated because it relies on other people's work about what those planetary boundaries are and what the social fabric and framework of our lives is. She has the sustainable development goals as well as the planetary boundaries in that framework. And yet simple, because once you've got that donut, once you can see it, um, you can very intuitively understand what it's, saying, what it's saying. And Kate has managed to cut through what is now 50 years of debate about economic growth and its environmental and social limits. Uh, the social limit, the, the Limits to Growth book by uh, Donella Meadows, amongst others, uh, for the Club of Rome was published in 1972. It's coming up to its 50th anniversary. Um, and yet we are still having exactly the same debates about growth as it stimulated. I wrote about that in, in my book in 1991. And I came to a position that again, I took a lot of words to uh, explain and Kate has cut through it by uh, talking about growth agnosticism. We should not have as our founding idea, whether in favor of growth or against growth, something to do with growth because growth just doesn't do what we need to happen in an economy. It doesn't generate well-being. It certainly doesn't generate environmental sustainability, but simply saying, well, then lots, let's not have growth doesn't do it either. Simply by not having growth, you have not solved your environmental or your social problems. If we could suddenly contract our economies, we would not get equality. In fact, we would almost certainly get inequality. And we would not even necessarily get a reduction in environmental impacts because it depended on what was growing uh, less. Growth in both its positive and negative signs is not the thing. So we need to be, as, growth, uh, as Kate has put it very succinctly, growth agnostic, and we need to focus on the crises and the solutions, which are to do with our well-being and the equality of our societies and in our environmental sustainability. That was an argument that I uh, tried to make um, a long time ago, and I'm still trying to make, and Kate has done it in, in, in such a, uh, a brilliant way. And of course, what you've also heard is that Kate is not just a theorist and writer, but is also now trying to help uh, other people put it into practice. And that's a, in itself a rather remarkable thing. People tend to fall into one or other category. They're either thinkers and writers um, or they are activists. And Kate has managed to be both. As a previous political economist once said, um, the point is not just to uh, understand the world, it is to change it. And Kate is, uh, as she's shown you, doing both of these uh, things. So I'm now going to be the party pooper, and I just want to raise some difficult issues. And they are the difficult issues that Kate herself recognizes. So in no sense is this a kind of criticism of what Kate has written or said, but I think it is incumbent upon us as people operating in a very difficult real world where the trends in most of those uh, 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 sustainable development goals and planetary boundaries are going still in the wrong direction to be aware of why and of how we need to think about dealing with those. So let me pick up five questions that I think we need to ask. The first is that there is a, and particularly around city-based donut, donut kind of practice, because that's where um, it's been picked up by people with some institutional power, not just kind of the people in, in civil society. Uh, it's not yet been picked up at central government uh, level. So it's being done at city level and that's what Kate talked about. So there's a core distributional question which we cannot get away from, which is that when anything less than the globe as a whole says we need to live sustainability, sustainably within planetary boundaries, the question is, well, what's your share of those? And what the fair share of any sustainability, sustainability boundary is, is a very difficult question. Um, some people have answered it in the only simple way of answering it, which is we should all just have exactly the same amount. So the per capita allowance for everybody on the world should be exactly the same. That's not really very realistic because we are living in such a distributionally unequal world. And it would be impossible to imagine the citizens of Amsterdam uh, reducing their uh, uh, their 
uh, in, environmental footprint to the level that was really per capita equal with everybody else on the world right now. And actually, it's not quite intellectually coherent since it's possible for people to become richer in low income countries without using the same amount of resources that the people of Amsterdam and high income countries have had to use and, uh, uh, and because they live in a structural uh, system which is uh, very resource intensive. That distributional question is very, very difficult. And it will be very interesting to see I, um, uh, exactly how that is. Uh, addressed. Secondly, um, while uh, Kate's framework for low income countries is pretty clear, there is a social floor below which people are in deprivation and poverty. And the first priority then is to lift everybody in poor countries up to the minimum, so the inner ring of the donut, and not be in that red shortfall that we saw in the middle. In developed high income countries, that is much more complex because although we do have very many people, many too many who live uh, 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 in those red zones, a lot of people are, are experiencing ill-being, not well-being, where they are above the floor on many of the uh, on many of those um, uh, kind of minimum living standard uh, 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 elements, and so. What we are trying to do in those people who in high income countries are now talking about a well-being economy is to try and understand better what it means to live a good life um, in ways that um, uh, may involve a bit less income, certainly for many people, less working time, but are also about changing the ways in which we live, the ways in which we relate to one another, um, uh, in, in which we share public goods and so on. This is complex. A lot of the work in this field, in the well-being field, has gone into new indicators. Now, new indicators are critical. We can't measure progress or well-being by GDP. That is unfortunately way, uh, an old argument. It's correct, but it really doesn't get us very far because once we've defined the indicators that we need to to uh, uh, to measure our well-being better and say we're aiming for the improvement in those things, not GDP, absolutely foundational thing we need to do we still then have to find the ways that we can improve those indicators. And the indicators in themselves don't create change. They enable us to think about it better, but they don't give us the tools with which to live better lives. And this is still a very complex thing in high income countries, which is how we live and how everybody can live with greater well-being. The third one is about powers and particularly uh, uh, the scale. Cities are quite powerful, but in many ways they're not. Cities can do some things, but there are lots of things they can't do because they don't have the powers, but also because they are not actually the units of economic life. They are the unit of transport, to some extent of housing. They're not a unit of energy in most places. The energy is a national system or sometimes a regional provincial system. They are not a, a unit of, of input output tables. If you look at the way cities consume, there isn't such a thing as a city. There are lots of consumers and businesses who happen to be located in that city, buying things um, and, uh, and exporting and importing things to people all over the rest of the world. The cities are actually just a geographic unit in terms of input and output of supply and demand. And cities don't have very much control over it. And although community wealth being uh, building, as Kate mentioned for Preston, and Cleveland and so on, is a is an interesting and potentially very powerful tool, it still won't affect the vast majority of activities that go on by the citizens and uh, businesses that are physically located geographically, territorially uh, within the city uh, boundaries. So there is something very uh, 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 important about cities, but they are also limited in what they can do. Fourthly, there is a really critical question, which I am happy to say is an empirical question, but I've become much more pessimistic about the answer to the empirical question, which is whether we can become sustainable, whether we can bring our consumption and production inside that outer boundary, out of the red overshoot zones of Kate's diagram and into the green safe uh, planetary living space, whether we can do that in the time that we now have available to do it at all. We live in systems that are path dependent. We are fossil fuel based because we've been fossil based fuel based for 200 years. We're trying very quickly now to try and get out of that, but it is taking time. We live in cities that are carbon based. They are based around cars. Uh, we have technologies which are resource intensive. Getting out of those 
without collapsing the economy, bringing them within that sustainability boundary is incredibly difficult. And it's become more difficult because instead of starting this process in 1972, when the Club of Rome first pointed all of this out, we are kind of just starting now. We started some of it. We started on the carbon thing 10 years ago, but on other uh, aspects of it, we're barely, we're barely starting at all. And that means that, of course, in the meantime, between 72 and, two, uh, and 2021, we've grown unsustainably massively. And that means that to bring us back within that sustainability boundary, we have to do it in 10 years and not in 50. In 50, it might well have been possible because we would need to do it, need to have reduced our impact two to three percent a year, as the IPPC, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, pointed out in its 2018 report about how we could live within a to uh, to a 1.5 degrees of warming only. We have to do this now only on greenhouse gas emissions. This is without biodiversity or other forms of pollution or resource use, seven to ten percent a year. That's a really really difficult challenge. And to be perfectly honest, we don't know whether it's possible. We literally don't know. The only way of finding out is to try. So this shouldn't stop us. We certainly shouldn't spend the next 10 years asking, is it possible? We have to try and do it. But this is a really difficult question. And those of us who were more optimistic about our ability to do this 30 or 20 years ago, those of us who are old enough to have been thinking about this then, must now feel more pessimistic, simply because the rates of, uh, of reduction of impact are greater. And then the fifth kind of question, is capitalism. Um, we don't live in a system that is uh, um, uh, that is producing these environmental and social problems um, in a kind of disembodied way. It is a system, and Kate has uh, pointed out that her own way of thinking is a systems way of thinking, and that system has very strong path-dependent dynamics, and it is not wrong to call it a capitalist system. And capitalism has very strong dynamics, partly because it has very strong concentrations of power, particularly around wealth and assets um, and around land in many countries, um, uh, and uh, but also because uh, we are all bound up with it. We are all consumers. If we're pension holders, we have shareholdings uh, in uh, unsustainable companies and so on. So capitalism is the kind of ele elephant in the room here, which is do the powers and dynamics of capitalism allow this kind of transformation? And of course, then that comes to the political question, which is, can we imagine this being done not just at a progressive city level like Amsterdam, but a national level where there are many more economic powers, the kind that cities don't have, and where you might imagine actually some of those uh, environmental constraints um, uh, really being operated. So I'll leave you with, um, uh, with uh, the two thoughts. So the first is, that if you believe that we have the overwhelming priority, not economic growth, definitely not that, is bringing environmental impacts within the sustainability boundary, the planetary boundaries, and bringing human beings up to the minimum level, then we should be defining that as the end of policy, as the goal of policy. So I've argued for a sustainable economy act in the UK modeled on our climate change act. Our climate change act, which I was very lucky enough to be involved in, in writing when I was in, in government, sets environmental limits around the UK economy in a way that is very consonant with the donut. It says the UK economy will not emit more than X level of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And then on, on a five year trajectory, uh, every five years there's a new trajectory for achieving it. Now you might argue that we're not doing that rapid, more rapidly enough, but the structure there is completely right. There's a boundary, we have to live within it. We don't do that for the rest of the environment. And 40 years of environmental law, uh, has not stopped the environment getting worse. Why? Because we've never placed boundaries around it. And my belief is that we have to do that. We have to say there will be boundaries around the economy. We will set those boundaries. They will be based on a fair share within a global uh, total. And then we will constrain economic activity to live within it. And we will drive innovation to make sure that we can live within those boundaries with as much well-being as possible. And similarly, we need to do that at the floor. We need to do that at the human floor. We should be talking about universal basic services. I'm not actually in favor of the universal basic income, but it's the same idea, which is that there are minimum standards of living that everybody should have. And we should be defining those and give people rights uh, to them. And we should obviously be do, trying to do that at a global level, though that's much more difficult, but certainly at a national level in high income countries. So let's focus on the priorities, which are not exceeding the outer boundary and bringing everybody up to the, uh, the uh, inner circle. And the second thought is about Kate's theory of change. And I'm going to raise my sixth kind of big question, which is, you can imagine this happening at a city level, because it already is. Can you imagine it happening at a national level? Can you imagine 
government saying we're going to be practitioners of donut economics? And if not, how do we make them? Because in the end, the big power still lies at national level. We are interdependent globally. We have powerful and important local authorities, but the big powers, the legislative coercive power of the state rests at a national level. So we need this to become a national political and economic ambition. And that is a big challenge for all of us. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Kate, you have, if you feel burning need to respond to Michael, please do, but we have a shed load of questions in the Q&A. So um, it's up to you, but if you are gonna to respond to Michael, keep it short, and then we'll get time for more questions. Okay, well, I, that was just brilliant, brilliant. Um, I, I love that. I love all those thoughts. And I will resist the temptation to respond to every single one. Uh, let's go. Um, the donut, of course, does not provide us with well-being. That's it, it does. It, right. You could live within the donut and still say people don't feel that they have well-being. I think of the donut as the preconditions for well-being. So we, we're certainly not going to have people saying they're experiencing well-being if they're not living within this over the social foundation and we're not within planetary boundaries. So I see it as a precondition for that move towards well-being economies. I think they work really, really well together in that way. On the point you were making about how do we say what is a city or a nation's share of pressure on planetary boundaries, completely agree. That distributional question is what's hampered the climate negotiations for 25 years? Who, what is our fair share of doing that? I think the data are coming through more and more. I mean, there'll always be the ethical question, but the, the researchers are on the case and there's new data going to be coming through from Jason Hickel, Andrew Fanning and, and Dan O'Neill on historical, not just historical carbon emissions, but historical material footprints. So the, the numbers and the empirics are going to be more sitting there and we're going to see essentially that we don't know exactly what each nation's level is, but all that red I showed us on Norway just tells us one thing. It's inwards, Norway. It's inwards. It's down. OK, you don't need to know where exact level you should be is before you know that you need to start reducing. So it gives us a very strong sense of direction. Um, then can we get back within the planetary boundaries? I mean, that is the existential 21st century question. If someone looks at the donut, looks at that overshoot donut I showed with the red. If you were saying to me, I'm, I come from the future and I'm telling you, you we, we, never, we, we won't. We can't. It, we could have. As you said, we could have if we'd started when Donella Meadows and others wrote the limits growth, but we won't. We will live the 21st century outside of planetary boundaries. Now, if that's the if that's the message from the future, then what what is the implication for what we do today? I've thought a lot about this one. It's a really hard place to sit, but I still think, well, surely we would do everything we can to stay as close as we can. To those planetary boundaries because they're, they're zones of uncertainty so we certainly wouldn't say oh we're over the boundary because we already are over the boundary we wouldn't say it's we're over the boundary we can't get so let's just you know let, let's just blow the whole thing no we would still try to come within so it still seems to me to hold as a useful framework in a space where we believe we're going to live outside it. and by the way it's at least at least as likely that millions or billions of people are still going to be living in that space of social shortfall as well and yet I still would say it's still the goal to aim to get into that space. Um, capitalism. I don't, yeah, I don't talk a lot about capitalism and I'll, and I'll, and I, and I know you do, Michael, in, in your book and things. And I'll, I'll say why, because I've found that when someone says capitalism, if I were to do, we would do a poll right now. What does everyone think capitalism means? We get a hundred different answers of what people think we mean. So unless we really define what we're talking about, I don't use it because if you say capitalism, someone goes socialism, someone goes communism, and then we're having a little bashing match and we're, we're talking across purposes and then people get cross. So I think of it as a black box concept. In fact, I, I, I have one here. I, I made the black box of capitalism so that you can, you can lift the lid and ask yourself, what are you gonna find in it? Um, I, I also have a black box of socialism, don't worry. Um, but I think the core design features of capitalism that matter are in everything I was saying from divisive to distributive. Well, that's a fundamental challenge to capital. And let's go through the ownership of the assets of a city or the assets of a company. We get down to the bottom and who ownership of land and housing, of business, of finance, of data, of technology. That is the capitalist question. Who gets to own the sources of wealth creation? So I prefer to talk about it without using the big C word because I think it inflames 20th century debates. And actually, I think if we look specifically at the dynamics we're trying to tackle, more people go further together without realizing they're in that debate 
than they would otherwise than if we put the big labels on it. So I think we are having a debate about capitalism. And, and actually, one of our rules of donut economics is please don't present donut economics as a new form of capitalism, because we just think, let's take the old labels off, look deeper, come up with new dynamics, and let's go further. Last question. OK, cities are using it, but will nations? Well, I don't see why not. I, I'll, be, I'll be honest, when I wrote Donut Economics, I intentionally didn't think of government, or city or national, because I thought if I write this book trying to make it appealing to governments, I will write such an incremental book. I'll write a really 2020 book. This was 2016, right? I write a book that's practical and feasible and doable and full of really good policy recommendations that are all there in the world already. Why would I do that? So I literally wiped government and policymaking from my mind. I thought, I don't care, to hell with that. I'm going for the long view. And what's amazed me is that ever since the book came out, the governments have come, they've come running, saying whether it's the civil servants or the policymakers. In the UK, this book has had engagement across the spectrum from Caroline Lucas to Michael Gove and David Davis through, via the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party in between. The same thing in the Netherlands. And that to me is really healthy because it shows this isn't left or right. Donuts don't have left and right wings. They. It, it's, a, it's a concept that every political party should be able to say, yeah, of course, that's not where we need to get to. We might bring different policies for getting there, but let's have that debate. Um, Jacinda Ardern uh, was interviewed and she said she'd read Donut Economics and it was re reconfirming what she already thought. So I, I see glimmers of impact there. And then in December, I was invited to present Donut Economics to the Biden Treasury transition team. So... I'm not going to write off the idea that national governments are going to be interested. Of course, it's a massive challenge to the mainstream structures that we call capitalism. Let's bring it on. I mean, if we want to live within planetary boundaries and we want regenerative and distributive economies and we put that first, then it's going to take us to the heart of conversations about finance and how finance performs and what it expects and demands and who owns the sources of wealth creation. And let's have those conversations. I, I know you're as up for that as I am. So. Okay, let, I think we had to have a conversation with the, the other people on the call as well. Um, that was fantastic, brilliant presentation, fantastic discussion, fantastic response. We now have to say goodbye to the YouTube um, contingent. Uh, thanks for coming.